the Mahabharata of Krishna Dvipayana Vyasa. Translated into English prose from the original Sanskrit text by Pratap Chandra Roy CIE. This free ebook has been downloaded from holybooks.com. Virata Purva. Section 20. Kichhe Kabadha Purva continued. Draupadi said, Alas on account of that desperate gambler, I am now under Sudeshna's command, living in the palace in the guise of a siren tree. And, O oh chastiser of force behold the plight of poignant woe which I, a princess am now in. I am living in expectation of the close of this stated period. The extreme of misery, therefore, is mine. Success of purpose, victory and defeat, as regards mortals are transitory. It is in this belief that I am living in expectation of the return of prosperity to my husbands. Prosperity and adversity revolve like a wheel. It is in this belief that I am living in expectation of the return of prosperity to my husbands. That cause which bringeth on victory, may bring defeat as well. I live in this hope. Why dost thou not, O Bimasina, regard me as one dead? I have heard that persons that give may beg, that they who slay may be slain, and that they who overthrow others may themselves be overthrown by force. Nothing is difficult for destiny and none can override destiny. It is for this that I am awaiting the return of favorable fortune. As a tank once dried, is filled up once again, so hoping for a change for the better, I await the return of prosperity. When one's business that hath been well provided for is seen to be frustrated, a truly wise person should never strive for bringing back good fortune. Plunged as I am in sorrow, asked or asked by thee to explain the purpose of these words spoken by me, I shall tell thee everything. Queen of the sons of Pandu and daughter of Drupada, who else, save myself, would wish to live, having fallen into such a plight? O repressor of force, the misery, therefore, that hath overtaken me. Hath really humiliated the entire Kuru race, the Panchalas, and the sons of Pandu. Surrounded by numerous brothers and father-in-law and sons, what are their women having such cause for joy, save myself, would be afflicted with such woe. Surely, I must in my childhood have committed acts highly offensive to the three through whose displeasure, O bull of the Bharata race, I have been visited with such consequences. Mark, O son of Pandu, the pallor that hath come over my complexion which not even a life in the woods fraught as it was with extreme misery, could bring about. Thou O Preetha's son, knowest what happiness, O Bhima, was formerly mine. Even I who was such, have now sunk into servitude. Sorely distressed, I can find no rest. That the mighty armed and terrible bowman, Dhananjaya the son of Preetha, should now live like a fire that hath been poured out, make it me think of all this as attributable to destiny. Surely, O son of Preetha, it is impossible for men to understand the destinies of creatures in this world. I therefore think this downfall of yours as something that could not be averted by forethought. Alas, she who hath you all that resemble Indra himself to attend to her comforts, even she so just and exalted, hath now to attend to the comforts of others, of others that are to her far inferior in rank. Behold, O Pandava, my plight! It is what I do not deserve. Ye are alive, yet behold this inversion of order that time hath brought. She who had the whole earth to the verge of the sea under her control, is now under the control of Sudeshina and living in fear of her. She who had dependence to walk both before and behind her, alas now herself walketh before and behind Sudeshina. This O Kaunteya, is another grief of mine that is intolerable. Oh listen to it. She who had never, say for Kunti, pounded unguents even for her own use, now good but I thee, pound its sandal for others. O Kaunteya, behold these hands of mine which were not so before. 
Saying this she showed him her hands marked with corns. And she continued, She who had never feared Kunti herself nor thee and thy brothers, now standeth in fear before Virata as a slave, anxious of what that king of kings may say unto her regarding the proper preparation of the unguents, for Matsya like it not sandal pounded by others. Vesampayana continued, relating her woes thus, O Bharata, unto Bhimasena, Krishna began to weep silently, casting her eyes on Bhima. And then with words choked in tears and sighing repeatedly, she addressed Bhima in these words, powerfully stirring his heart, signal, O Bhima, must have been my offense of old unto the gods, for unfortunate as I am, I am yet alive when, O Pandava, I should die. Vesampayana continued. Then that slayer of hostile heroes Vrikodara, covering his face with those delicate hands of his wife, marked with corns, began to weep. And that mighty son of Kunti, holding the hands of Draupadi in his, shed copious tears. And afflicted with great woe he spoke these words. Thus ends the twentieth section in the Kichhekavadha Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 21, Kichhekavadha Purva continued. Bhima said, Fie on the might of my arms and fie on the Gandiva of Falguni, inasmuch as thy hands, read before, now become covered with corns. I would have caused a carnage in Virata's court but for the fact that Kunti's son eyed me by way of forbidding it, or like a mighty elephant, I would without ado have crushed the head of Kichheka intoxicated with the pride of sovereignty. When, O Krishna I beheld thee kicked by Kichheka, I conceived at that instant a wholesale slaughter of the Matsyas. Yudhishthira however forbade me by a glance and, O beauteous lady, understanding his intention I have kept quiet. That we have been deprived of our kingdom, that I have not yet slain the Kurus, that I have not yet taken the heads of Suyodhana and Karna and Suvila's son Sakuni, and the wicked Dusasana, these acts and omissions, O lady are consuming every limb of mine. The thought of those abides in my heart like a javelin implanted in it. O thou of graceful hips do not sacrifice virtue and O noble-hearted lady, subdue thy wrath. If King Yudhishthira hears from thee such rebukes, he will surely put an end to his life. If also the Nanjaya and the twins hear thee speak thus even they will renounce life. And if these, O slender-waisted maiden give up life, I also shall not be able to bear my own. In olden days Sergeti's daughter, the beautiful Sukanya followed into the forest Chiavana of Brigu's race, whose mind was under complete control and over whom, while engaged in ascetic meditation, the ants had built a hill. Thou mayst have heard that Indrasena also who in beauty was like unto Narayani herself, followed her husband aged a thousand years. Thou mayst have heard that Janaka's daughter Sita, the princess of Vaidha, followed her lord while living in dense woods. And that lady of graceful hips, Rama's beloved wife, afflicted with calamities and persecuted by the Rakshasas, at length regained the company of Rama. Lopamudra also, O timid one, endued with youth and beauty, followed Agastya, renouncing all the objects of enjoyment unattainable by men. And the intelligent and faultless Savitri also followed the heroic Satyavan, the son of Dumatsana, alone into the world of Yama. Even like these chast and beautiful ladies that I have named, thou O blessed girl, bloomest with every virtue. Do thou spend a short while more that is measured by even a half month. And when the thirteenth year is complete, thou wilt again become the queen regnant of a king. Hearing these words, Draupadi said, Unable, O Bhima, to bear my griefs it is from grief alone that I have shed these tears. I do not censure Yudhishthira. Nor is there any use in dwelling on the past. O Bhima of mighty strength, come quickly forward to the work of the hour. O Bhima, Kaiki, jealous of my beauty, always pains me by her endeavors to prevent the king from taking a fancy to me. 
and understanding this disposition of hers, the wicked soul Kichheka of immoral ways constantly solicits me himself. Angry with him for this, but then suppressing my rot I answer that wretch deprived of sense by lust, saying, O Kichheka, protect thyself. I am the beloved queen and wife of five Gandavas. Those heroes in wrath will slay thee that art so rash. Thus addressed, Kichheka of wicked soul replied unto me, saying, I have not the least fear of the Gandavas, O Sirendri of sweet smiles. I will slay a hundred thousand Gandavas, encountering them in battle. Therefore, O timid one, do thou consent. Hearing all this, I again addressed the lust afflicted Sutta, saying, Thou art no match for those illustrious Gandavas. Of respectable percentage and good disposition, I ever adhere to virtue and never wish for the death of any one. It is for this that thou I west, O Kichheka. At this that white of wicked soul burst out into a loud laughter. And it came to pass that Kaiki previously urged by Kichheka and moved by affection for her brother and desirous of doing him a good turn, dispatched me to him, saying, Do thou O Sirendri, fetch wine from Kichheka's quarters. On beholding me the Sutta's son at first addressed me in sweet words, and when that failed, he became exceedingly enraged, and intended to use violence. Understanding the purpose of the wicked Kichheka, I speedily rushed towards the place where the king was. Felling me on the ground the wretch then kicked me in the very presence of the king himself and before the eyes of Kanka and many others, including charioteers and royal favorites and elephant riders and citizens. I rebuked the king and Kanka again and again. The king, however, neither prevented Kichheka, nor inflicted any chastisement on him. The principal ally of King Viratha in war, the cruel Kichheka reft of virtue is loved by both the king and the queen. O exalted one, brave, proud, sinful, adulterous, and engrossed in all objects of enjoyment, he earneth immense wealth from the king, and robs the possessions of others even if they cry in distress. And he never walketh in the path of virtue, nor doth he any virtuous act. Of wicked soul, and vicious disposition, haughty and villainous, and always afflicted by the shafts of Kurna, though repulsed repeatedly, if he sees me again, he will outrage me. I shall then surely renounce my life. Although striving to acquire virtue, on my death your highly meritorious acts will come to naught. Ye that are now obeying your pledge, ye will lose your wife. By protecting one's wife one's offspring are protected, and by protecting one's offspring, one's own self is protected. And it is because one begets one's own self in one's wife that the wife is called Jaya by the wise. The husband also should be protected by the wife, thinking, how else will he take his birth in my womb? I have heard it from Brahmanas expounding the duties of the several orders that a Kshatriya hath no other duty than subduing enemies. Alas Kichheka kicked me in the very presence of Yudhishthira the just, and also of thyself, O Bhimasena of mighty strength. It was thou, O Bhima, that didst deliver me from the terrible Jatasura. It was thou also that with thy brothers didst vanquish Jayadratha. Do thou now slay this wretch also who hath insulted me. Presuming upon his being a favorite of the king, Kichheka, O Bharata, hath enhanced my woe. Do thou therefore, smash this lustful white even like an earthen pot dashed upon a stone. If O Bharata, tomorrow's sun sheds his rays upon him who is the source of many griefs of mine, I shall surely, mixing poison with some drink, Drink it up for I never shall yield to Kichheka. For better it were, O Bhima, that I should die before thee. Vesampayana continued. Having said this, Krishna hiding her face in Bhima's breast began to weep and Bhima, embracing her, consoled her to the best of his power. And having abundantly consoled that slender-waisted daughter of Drupada by means of words fraught with grave reason and sense, 
he wiped with his hands her face flooded with tears. And thinking of Kichheka and licking with his tongue the corners of his mouth, Bhima filled with wrath thus spake to that distressed lady. Thus ends the twenty-first section in the Kichheka Vadha Prava of the Virata Pava. Section 22, Kichheka Vadha Prava continued. Bhima said, I will ultimate one do even as thou sayest. I will presently slay Kichheka with all his friends. O Yajnasini of sweet smiles, tomorrow evening renouncing sorrow and grief, manage to have a meeting with Kichheka. The dancing hall that the king of the Matsya heart caused to be erected is used by the girls for dancing during the day. They repair however, to their homes at night. There in that hall is an excellent and well-placed wooden bedstead. Even there I will make him see the spirits of his diseased grandsires. But O oh beautiful one, when thou holdest converse with him, thou must manage it so that others may not espy thee. Vesampayana continued, having thus conversed with others, and shed tears in grief, they waited for the dawn of that night with painful impatience. And when the night had passed away, Kichheka, rising in the morning went to the palace and accosted Draupadi saying, throwing thee down in the court, I kicked thee in the presence of the king. Attacked by my mighty self thou couldst not obtain protection. This Viratha is in name only the king of the Matsyas. Commanding the forces of this realm it is I who am the real lord of the Matsya. Do thou O timid one, accept me cheerfully. I shall become thy slave. And O thou of graceful hips, I will immediately give thee a hundred nishkat and engage a hundred male and a hundred female servants to tend thee and will also bestow on thee cars yoked with she mules. O timid lady let our union take place. Draupadi replied, O Kichheka no even this is my condition. Neither thy friends nor thy brothers should know thy union with me. I am in terror of detection by those illustrious Gandavas. Promise me this and I yield to thee. Hearing this Kichheka said, I will O thou of graceful hips, do even as thou sayest. Afflicted by the god of love I will, O beauteous damsel alone repair to thy abode for union with thee, O thou of thighs round and tapering like the trunks of the plantain, so that those Gandavas, effulgent as the sun may not come to know of this act of thine. Draupadi said, Do thou when it is dark, go to the dancing hall erected by the king of the Matsyas, where the girls dance during the day, repairing to their respective homes at night. The Gandavas do not know that place. We shall then without doubt escape all censure. Vesampayana continued, reflecting on the subject of her conversation with Kichheka, that half a day seemed to Krishna as long as a whole month. And the stupid Kichheka also, not knowing that it was death that had assumed the form of a sirendri, returning home experienced the greatest delight. And deprived of sense by lust, Kichheka became speedily engaged in embellishing his person with unguents and garlands and ornaments. And while he was doing all this, thinking of that damsel of large eyes the day seemed to him to be without an end. And the beauty of Kichheka, who was about to forsake his beauty forever seemed to heighten like the wick of a burning lamp about to expire. And reposing the fullest confidence in Draupadi, Kichheka, deprived of his senses by lust and absorbed in the contemplation of the expected meeting, did not even perceive that the day had departed. Meanwhile, the beautiful Draupadi approaching her husband Bhima of the Kuru race, stood before him in the kitchen. And that lady with tresses ending in beautiful curls then spake unto him saying, O chastiser of force, even as thou hadst directed, I have given Kichheka to understand that our meeting will take place in the dancing hall. Alone will he come at night to the empty hall. Slay him there O thou of mighty arms. Do thou O son of Kunti, repair to that dancing hall and take the life, O Pandava of Kichheka, that son of Asuta intoxicated with vanity. From vanity alone that son of Asuta slights the Gandavas. 
O oh best of smiters lift him up from the earth even as Krishna had lifted up the Naga, Kaliya, from the Yamuna. Pandava, afflicted as I am with grief, wipe thou my tears and blessed be thou, protect thy own honor and that of thy race. Bhima said, Welcome O beauteous lady. Except the glad tidings thou bringest me, I need O thou of exceeding beauty no other aid whatever. The delight that I feel, O thou of great beauty on hearing from thee about my coming encounter with Kichheka, is equal to what I felt in slaying Hidimva. I swear unto thee by truth, by my brothers and by morality, that I will slay Kichheka even as the lord of the celestial slew Dhritra. Whether secretly or openly I will crush Kichheka and if the Matsyas fight for him, then I will slay them too. And slaying Duryodhana afterwards, I shall win back the earth. Let Yudhishthira, the son of Kunti continue to pay homage unto the king of Matsya. Hearing these words of Bhima, Draupadi said, In order that, O Lord thou mayst not have to renounce the truth already pledged to me, do thou O hero slay Kichheka in secret. Bhima assuring her said, Even today I shall slay Kichheka together with his friends unknown to others during the darkness of the night. I shall O faultless lady, crush, even as an elephant crusheth a veil of fruit, that head of the wicked Kichheka who wisheth for what is unattainable by him. Vesampayana continued, repairing first to the place of assignation at night, Bhima sat down disguising himself. And he waited there in expectation of Kichheka, like a lion lying in wait for a deer. And Kichheka having embellished his person as he chose, came to the dancing hall at the appointed time in the hope of meeting Panchali. And thinking of the assignation he entered the chamber. And having entered that hall enveloped in deep gloom that wretch of wicked soul came upon Bhima of incomparable prowess, who had come a little before and who was waiting in a corner. And as an insect approached towards a flaming fire, or a puny animal towards a lion, Kichheka approached Bhima lying down in a bed and burning in anger at the thought of the insult offered to Krishna, as if he were the Sutta's death. And having approached Bhima, Kichheka possessed by lust and his heart and soul filled with ecstasy smilingly said, O thou of penciled eyebrows, to thee I have already given many and various kinds of wealth from the stores earned by me, as well as a hundred maids and many fine robes and also a mansion with an inner apartment adorned with beauteous and lovely and youthful maid servants and embellished by every kind of sport and amusement. And having set all those apart for thee, I have speedily come hither. And all on a sudden, women have begun to praise me, saying, There is not in this world any other person like unto thee in beauty and dress. Hearing this, Bhima said, it is well that thou art handsome and it is well thou praisest thyself. I think however that thou hadst never before this such pleasurable touch. Thou hast an acute touch and knowest the ways of gallantry. Skilled in the art of love making thou art a favorite with women. There is none like thee in this world. Vesampayana continued, saying this, that son of Kunti, the mighty armed Bhima of terrible prowess suddenly rose up and laughingly said, Thy sister O wretch, shall today behold thee dragged by me to the ground, like a mighty elephant, huge as a mountain, dragged to the ground by a lion. Thyself slain Sirendri will live in peace and we, her husbands will also live in peace. Saying this the mighty Bhima seized Kichheka by the hairs of his head, which were adorned with Lee garlands and thus seized with force by the hair, that foremost of mighty persons Kichheka quickly freed his hair and grasped the arms of Bhima. And then between those lions among men fired with wrath, between that chief of the Kichheka clan and that best of men, there ensued a hand-to-hand -hand encounter, like that between two powerful elephants for a female elephant in the season of spring, or like that which happened in days of yore between those lions among monkeys, the brothers Wali and Sugriva. And both equally infuriate and both eager for victory, 
Both those combatants raised their arms resembling snakes furnished with five hoods and attacked each other with their nails and teeth, wrought up to frenzy of wrath. Impetuously assailed by the powerful Kichheka in that encounter, the resolute Bhima did not waver a single step. And locked in each other's embraces and dragging each other, they fought on like two mighty bulls. And having nails and teeth for their weapons, the encounter between them was fierce and terrible like that of two furious tigers. And felling each other in fury they encountered each other like a couple of elephants with rent temples. And the mighty Bhima then seized Kichheka and Kichheka, that foremost of strong persons threw Bhima down with violence. And as those mighty combatants fought on, the crash of their arms produced a loud noise that resembled the clatter of splitting bamboos. Then Vrikodara throwing Kichheka down by main force within the room began to toss him about furiously even as a hurricane toss at a tree. And attacked thus in battle by the powerful Bhima, Kichheka grew weak and began to tremble. For all that however, he tugged at the Pandava to the best of his power. And attacking Bhima and making him waver little, the mighty Kichheka struck him with his knees and brought him down to the ground. And overthrown by the powerful Kichheka, Bhima quickly rose up like Yama himself with mace in hand. And thus that powerful Sutta and the Pandava, intoxicated with strength and challenging each other, grappled with each other at midnight in that solitary place. And as they roared at each other in wrath, that excellent and strong edifice began to shake every moment. And slapped on the chest by the mighty Bhima, Kichheka fired with wrath moved not a single pace. And bearing for a moment only that onslaught incapable of being born on earth, the Sutta overpowered by Bhima's might became enfeebled. And seeing him waning weak, Bhima endured with great strength forcibly drew Kichheka towards his breast and began to press hard. And breathing hard again and again in wrath, that best of victors, Vrikodara, forcibly seized Kichheka by the hair. And having seized Kichheka, the mighty Bhima began to roar like a hungry tiger that hath killed a large animal. And finding him exceedingly exhausted, Vrikodara bound him fast with his arms, as one binds a beast with a cord. And then Bhima began for a long while to whirl the senseless Kichheka, who began to roar frightfully like a broken trumpet. And in order to pacify Krishna's wrath Vrikodara grasped Kichheka's throat with his arms and began to squeeze it. And assailing with his knees the waist of that worst of the Kichhekas, all the limbs of whose body had been broken into fragments and whose eyelids were closed, Vrikodara slew him as one would slay a beast. And beholding Kichheka entirely motionless, the son of Pandu began to roll him about on the ground. And Bhima then said, Slaying this wretch who intended to violate our wife, this thorn in the side of Sirendri, I am freed from the debt I owed to my brothers, and have attained perfect peace. And having said this, that foremost of men, with eyes red in wrath, relinquished his hold of Kichheka whose dress and ornaments had been thrown off his person, whose eyes were rolling and whose body was yet trembling. And that foremost of mighty persons, squeezing his own hands, and biting his lips in rage again attacked his adversary and thrust his arms and legs and neck and head into his body like the wielder of the pinaka, reducing into shapless mass the deer, which form sacrifice had assumed in order to escape his ire. And having crushed all his limbs and reduced him into a ball of flesh, the mighty Bhimasena showed him unto Krishna. And endued with mighty energy that hero then addressed Draupadi, that foremost of all women, saying, Come princess of Panchala and see what heart become of that lustful wretch. And saying this, Bhima of terrible prowess began to press with his feet the body of that wicked white. And lighting a torch then and showing Draupadi the body of Kichheka, that hero addressed her saying, O thou of tresses ending in beautiful curls, those that solicit thee, endued as thou art with an excellent disposition and every virtue, will be slain by me even as this Kichheka heart been, O timid one. 
and having accomplished that difficult task so highly agreeable to Krishna, having indeed slain Kichheka and thereby pacified his wrath, Bhima bade farewell to Krishna, the daughter of Drupada, and quickly went back to the kitchen. And Draupadi also, that best of women, having caused Kichheka to be slain had her grief removed and experienced the greatest delight. And addressing the keepers of the dancing hall, she said, Come ye and behold Kichheka who had violated after other people's wives lieth down here, slain by my Gandhava husbands. And hearing these words, the guards of the dancing hall soon came by thousands to that spot, torches in hand. And repairing to that room, they beheld the lifeless Kichheka thrown on the ground, drenched with blood. And beholding him without arms and legs, they were filled with grief. And as they gazed at Kichheka, they were struck with amazement. And seeing that superhuman act, viz, the overthrow of Kichheka, they said, Where is his neck, and where are his legs? And beholding him in this plight they all concluded that he had been killed by a Gandhava. Thus ends the 22nd section in the Kichheka Vadha Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 23 Kichheka Vadha Purva continued. Vesampayana said, Then all the relatives of Kichheka, arriving at that place beheld him there and began to wail aloud, surrounding him on all sides. And beholding Kichheka with every limb mangled, and lying like a tortoise dragged to dry ground from the water, all of them were overcome with exceeding fright, and the bristles of their bodies stood on end. And seeing him crushed all over by Bhima, like a Denava by Indra, they proceeded to take him outside, for performing his funeral obsequies. And then those persons of the Sutta clan thus assembled together respite Krishna of faultless limbs hard by, who stood reclining on a pillar. And all the Kichhekis assembled there, exclaimed, Let this unjust woman be slain for whom Kichheka heart himself lost his life. Or without slaying her here, let us cremate her with him that had lusted after her, for it behoveth us to accomplish in every way what is agreeable to that diseased son of Sutta. And then they addressed Virata, saying, It is for her sake that Kichheka heart lost his life. Let him therefore be cremated along with her. It behoveth thee to grant this permission. Thus addressed by them, King Virata, O monarch, knowing fully well the prowess of the Sutta gave his assent to Sirendri being burnt along with the Sutta's son. And at this, the Kichhekas approaching the frightened and stupefied Krishna of lotus-like eyes, seized her with violence, and binding that damsel of slender waist and placing her upon the bier, they set out with great energy towards the cemetery. And O King, while thus forcibly carried towards the cemetery by those sons of the Sutta tribe, the blameless and just Krishna living under the protections of her lords, then wailed aloud for the help of her husbands, saying, O oh, let Jaya and Jayanta and Vijaya and Jayatsana and Jayadwala listen to my words. The Suttas are taking me away. Let those illustrious Gandhavas endued with speed of hand, the clatter of whose cars is loud and the twang of whose bowstrings in the midst of the mighty conflict are heard like the roar of thunder, listen to my words. The Suttas are taking me away. Vesampayana continued, hearing those sorrowful words and lamentations of Krishna, Bhima, without a moment's reflection started up from his bed and said, I have heard, O Sirendri, the words thou hast spoken. Thou hast, therefore, O timid lady, no more fear at the hands of the Suttas. Vesampayana continued. Having said this, the mighty armed Bhima desirous of slaying the Kichhekas, began to swell his body. And carefully changing his attire, he went out of the palace by a wrong egress. And climbing over a wall by the aid of a tree, he proceeded towards the cemetery whither the Kichhekas had gone. And having leapt over the wall, and gone out of the excellent city, Bhima impetuously rushed to where the Suttas were. And, O monarch, proceeding towards the funeral pyre he beheld a large tree, 
tall as Palmyra palm, with gigantic shoulders and withered top. And that slayer of force grasping with his arms that tree measuring ten viamas, uprooted it, even like an elephant, and placed it upon his shoulders. And taking up that tree with trunk and branches and measuring ten viamas, that mighty hero rushed towards the Suthas, like Yama himself, mace in hand. And by the impetus of his rush, Banyans and peoples and Kinshukas, falling down on earth lay in clusters. And beholding that Gandhava approach them like a lion in fury, all the Suthas trembling with fear and greatly distressed, became panic struck. And they addressed each other, saying, Lo, the powerful Gandhava cometh hither, filled with rage, and with an oppressed tree in hand. Let Sirendri, therefore, from whom this danger of ours hath harrison, be set free. And beholding the tree that had been uprooted by Bhimasena, they set Draupadi free and ran breathlessly towards the city. And seeing them run away, Bhima, that mighty son of the wind god, dispatched O foremost of kings, by means of that tree, a hundred and five of them unto the abode of Yama, like the wielder of the thunderbolt slaying the Denavas. And setting Draupadi free from her bonds, he then O king comforted her. And that mighty armed and irrepressible Drikodara, the son of Pandu, then addressed the distressed princess of Panchala with face bathed in tears, saying, the so timid one, are they slain that wrong thee without cause? Return, O Krishna, to the city. Thou hast no longer any fear, I myself will go to the Virata's kitchen by another route. Vesampayana continued, It was thus, O Bharata, that a hundred and five of those Kichhekas were slain. And their corpses lay on the ground, making the place look like a great forest overspread with uprooted trees after a hurricane. Thus fell those hundred and five Kichhekas. And including Virata's general slain before, the slaughtered Suthas numbered one hundred and six. And beholding that exceedingly wonderful feat, men and women that assembled together, were filled with astonishment. And the power of speech, O Bharata, was suspended in everyone. Thus ends the twenty-third section in the Kichheka Vadha Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 24, Kichheka Vadha Purva continued. Vesampayana said, and beholding the Suthas slain, the citizens went to the king, and represented unto him what had happened, saying, O king, those mighty sons of the Suthas have all been slain by the Gandavas. Indeed they lie scattered on the earth like huge peaks of mountains riven by thunder. Sirendri also, having been set free, returneth to thy palace in the city. Alas O king, if Sirendri commit thy entire kingdom will be endangered. Sirendri is endued with great beauty, the Gandavas also here exceedingly powerful. Men again, without doubt are naturally sexual. Devise therefore O king, without delay such means that in consequence of wrongs done to Sirendri thy kingdom may not meet with destruction. Hearing those words of theirs, Virata that lord of hosts said unto them, Do ye perform the last rites of the Suthas. Let all the Kichhekas be burnt, in one blazing pyre with gems and fragrant unguents in profusion, and filled with fear, the king then addressed his queen Sudeshna, saying, when Sirendri comes back do thou tell her these words from me, Blessed be thou, O fair-faced Sirendri. Go thou whithersoever thou likest. The king hath been alarmed, O thou of graceful hips at the defeat already experienced at the hand of the Gandavas. Protected as thou art by the Gandavas, I dare not personally say all this to thee. A woman however cannot offend and it is for this that I tell thee all this through a woman. Vesampayana continued, thus delivered by Bhimasena after the slaughter of the Suthas, the intelligent and youthful Krishna relieved from all her fears, washed her limbs and clothes in water, and proceeded towards the city, like a doe frightened by a tiger. And beholding her, the citizens O king, 
afflicted with the fear of the Gandavas fled in all directions. And some of them went so far as to shut their eyes. And then O King, at the gate of the kitchen, the princess of Panchala saw Bimasena staying, like an infuriate elephant of gigantic proportions, and looking upon him with wonder expanded eyes. Dhrampadi by means of words intelligible to them alone, said, I bow unto that prince of the Gandavas, who hath rescued me. At these words of her, Bhima said, hearing these words of hers in obedience to whom those persons were hitherto living in the city, they will henceforth range here, regarding themselves as freed from the dead. Vesampayana continued, then she beheld the mighty armed Dhananjaya in the dancing hall instructing King Virata's daughters in dancing. And issuing with Arjuna from the dancing hall, all those damsels came to Krishna who had an evade there and who had been persecuted so sorely, all innocent though she was. And they said, By good luck also it is, O Sirendri, that thou hast been delivered from thy dangers. By good luck it is that thou hast returned safe. And by good luck also it is that those Suthas have been slain that had wronged thee, innocent though thou art. Hearing this, Drihanala said, How hast thou O Sirendri been delivered? And how have those sinful wretches been slain? I wish to learn all this from thee exactly as it occurred. Sirendri replied, O blessed Drihanala always passing thy days happily in the apartments of the girls, what concern hast thou with Sirendri's fate to say? Thou hast no grief to bear that Sirendri hath to bear. It is for this that thou askest me thus, distressed as I am in ridicule. Thereat Drihanala said, O blessed one, Drihanala also hath unparalleled sorrows of her own. She hath become as low as a brute. Thou dost not O girl understand this. I have lived with thee and thou too hast lived with us. When therefore thou art afflicted with misery, who is it that will not, O thou of beautiful hips, feel it? But no one can completely read another's heart. Therefore it is O amiable one, that thou knowest not my heart. Vesampayana continued, then Draupadi accompanied by those girls entered the royal abode, desirous of appearing before Sudeshna. And when she came before the queen, Virata's wife addressed her at the command of the king saying, Do thou, O Sirendri, speedily go whithersoever thou likest. The king, good but I thee, hath been filled with fear at this discomfiture at the hands of the Gandavas. Thou art O thou of graceful eyebrows, young and unparalleled on earth in beauty. Thou art besides an object of desire with men. The Gandavas again are exceedingly wrathful. Thereat Sirendri said, O beauteous lady let the king suffer me to live here for only thirteen days more. Without doubt the Gandavas also will be highly obliged at this. They will then convey me hence and do what would be agreeable to Virata. Without doubt the king by doing this, with his friends, will reap great benefit. Thus ends the 24th section in the Kichhekabadha Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 25, Kichhekabadha Purva continued. Vesampayana said, at the slaughter of Kichheka and brothers, people oaking, thinking of this terrible feat were filled with surprise. And in the city and the provinces it was generally bruited about that, for bravery the kings were Lava and Kichheka were both mighty warriors. The wicked Kichheka however had been an oppressor of men and a dishonorer of other people's wives. And it was for this that wicked of sinful soul had been slain by the Gandavas. And it was thus oaking that people began to speak from province to province of the invincible Kichheka, that slayer of hostile ranks. Meanwhile, the spies employed by Dhritarashtra's son, having searched various villages and towns and kingdoms and done all that they had been commanded to do and completed their examination in the manner directed, of the countries indicated in their orders, returned to Nagarupa, gratified with at least one thing that they had learnt. 
and seeing Dhritarashtra sunking Duryodhana of the Kuru race seated in his court with Drona and Karna and Kripa, with the high souled Bhishma, his own brothers, and those great warriors the Trigatas, they addressed him, saying, O Lord of men, great hath been the care always bestowed by us in the search after the sons of Pandu in that mighty forest. Searched have we through the solitary wilderness abounding with deer and other animals and overgrown with trees and creepers of diverse kind. Searched have we also in arbors of matted woods and plants and creepers of every species, but we have failed in discovering that track by which Preetha's son of irrepressible energy may have gone. Searched have we in these and other places for their footprints. Searched have we closely, O King, on mountain tops and in inaccessible fastnesses, in various kingdoms and provinces teeming with people, in encampments and cities. No trace have yet been found of the sons of Pandu. Good but I thee, O bull among men. It seems that they have perished without leaving a mark behind. O foremost of warriors, although we followed in the track of those warriors, Yet O oh best of men we soon lost their footprints and do not know their present residence. O oh Lord of men for some time we followed in the wake of their charioteers. And making our inquiries duly, we truly ascertained what we desired to know. O oh slayer of foes, the charioteers reached Varavati without the sons of Preetha among them. O oh king neither the sons of Pandu, nor the chaste Krishna are in that city of Yadavas. O bull of the Bharata race we have not been able to discover either their trick or their present abode. Salutations to thee, they are gone for good. We are acquainted with the disposition of the sons of Pandu and know something of the feats achieved by them. It behoveth thee therefore O lord of men, to give us instructions O monarch, as to what we should next do in the search after the sons of Pandu. O hero listen also to these agreeable words of ours, promising great good to thee. King Matsya's commander Kichheka of wicked soul, by whom the Trigatas O monarch were repeatedly vanquished and slain with mighty force, now liet low on the ground with all his brothers slain, O monarch, by invisible Gandhavas during the hours of darkness, O thou of unfading glory. Having heard this delightful news about the discomfiture of our enemies, we have been exceedingly gratified O Kauravya. Do thou now ordain what should next be done. Thus ends the 25th section in the Kichheka Vadha Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 26, Guharana Purva. Vesampayana said, having listened to these words of his spies, King Duryodhana reflected inwardly for some time and then addressed his courtiers saying, It is difficult to ascertain the course of events definitely. Discern ye all therefore whither the sons of Pandu have gone, of this thirteenth year which they are to pass undiscovered by us all, the greater part hath already expired. What remains is by much the smaller. If indeed the sons of Pandu can pass undiscovered what remains of this year, devoted to the vow of truth as they are, they will then have fulfilled their pledge. They will then return like mighty elephants with temporal juice trickling down, or like snakes of virulent poison. Filled with wrath, they will without doubt, be inflictors of terrible chastisement on the Kurus. It behoveth ye therefore, to make such efforts without loss of time as may induce the sons of Pandu acquainted as they are with the proprieties of time and staying as they now are in painful disguise, to re-enter the woods suppressing their rage. Indeed adopt ye such means as may remove all causes of quarrel and anxiety from the kingdom, making it tranquil and foolless and incapable of sustaining a diminution of territory. Hearing these words of Duryodhana Karna said, Let other spies, abler and more cunning and capable of accomplishing their object quickly go hence, O Bharata. Let them, well disguised wander through swelling kingdoms and populous provinces, prying into assemblies of the learned and delightful retreats of provinces. In the inner apartments of palaces, in shrines and holy spots, in mines and diverse other regions, the sons of Pandu should be searched after with well-directed eagerness. 
Let the sons of Pandu who are living in disguise be searched after by well skilled spies in large numbers, devoted to their work, themselves well disguised and all well acquainted with the objects of their search. Let the search be made on the banks of rivers, in holy regions, in villages and towns, in retreats of ascetics, in delightful mountains and mountain caves. When Karna ceased, Duryodhana's second brother Dusasana, wedded to a sinful disposition, then addressed his eldest brother and said, O monarch, O lord of men, let those spies only in whom we have confidence, receiving their rewards in advance, once more go after the search, this and what else hath been said by Karna have our fullest approval. Let all the spies engage themselves in the search according to the directions already given. Let these and others engage in the search from province to province according to approved rules. It is my belief however, that the track the Pandavas have followed or their present abode or occupation will not be discovered. Perhaps they are closely concealed, perhaps they have gone to the other side of the ocean. Or perhaps, proud as they are of their strength and courage, they have been devoured by wild beasts, or perhaps having been overtaken by some unusual danger they have perished for eternity. Therefore, O Prince of the Kuru race, dispelling all anxieties from thy heart, achieve what thou wilt, always acting according to thy energy. Thus ends the 26th section in the Guharana Purva of the Virata Purva. Section 27, Guharana Purva continued. Vesampayana said, Endued with mighty energy and possessed of great discernment, Drona then said, Persons like the sons of Pandu never perish nor undergo discomfiture. Brave and skilled in every science, intelligent and with senses under control, virtuous and grateful and obedient to the virtuous Yudhishthira, ever following in the wake of their eldest brother who is conversant with the conclusions of policy and virtue and profit, who is attached to them as a father, and who strictly adhereth to virtue and is firm in truth, persons like them that are thus devoted to their illustrious and royal brother, who gifted with great intelligence, never injure it. Anybody and who in his turn himself obeyed his younger brothers, never perish in this way. Why then should not Yudhishthira the son of Preeta possessing a knowledge of policy, be able to restore the prosperity of his brothers who are so obedient and devoted and high-souled? It is for this that they are carefully waiting for the arrival of their opportunity. Men such as these never perish. This is what I see by my intellect. Do therefore quickly and without loss of time, what should now be done, after proper reflection. And let also the abode which the sons of Pandu with souls under control as regards every purpose of life, are to occupy, be now settled. Heroic and sinless and possessed of ascetic merit, the Pandavas are difficult to be discovered within the period of non-discovery. Intelligent and possessed of every virtue, devoted to truth and versed in the principles of policy, endued with purity and holiness, and the embodiment of immeasurable energy, the son of Preeta is capable of consuming his force by a glance alone of his eyes. Knowing all this, do what is proper. Let us therefore once more search after them, sending Brahmanas and Charanas, ascetics crowned with success and others of this kind who may have our knowledge of those heroes. Thus ends the 27th section in the Guharana Purva of the Virata Purva. If you enjoyed this audiobook, please like and subscribe to be notified of when new audiobooks are uploaded. Thank you for listening and learning. Shanti.